In this series, we'll explore advanced KinFX applications. Assuming you're already familiar with Houdini and my KinFX 101 series, we'll focus on unique problem-solving techniques and KinFX applications. Some of these applications won't even be KinFX exclusive, but they'll help with the animation and rigging pipeline tremendously. If so if we jump into the FBX Raptor node, you'll see we have uh, FBX character imports and then some nulls um, just to visualize what we're looking at uh, and then the bone farm. So the first thing I think I want to talk about is some of the initial setup stuff. So this isn't the super flashy KinFX things, but these are things that are important to a lot of the functionality of KinFX and things that a lot of people skip or, or miss or don't set up. The first thing is a rest transform. There are, if you look at a lot of nodes here, like for example, if you look at a full body inverse kinematic and you go to the configure tab, you'll see it's using this rest pose. And if you go to a configure joints tab, you'll see it also has the ability to use a rest pose attribute. Now, we don't automatically have one on here. We don't have a rest attribute. And, and how do I get that? It, it's actually, it helps a lot for full body inverse kinematics and it, it helps a lot for a lot of Houdini's nodes. So, one of the first things you really should do is set up a rest transform and you get that with a rig stash pose. There's a few ways you can set it up. So you can set it up to store with a time shift. You can set it up to store with a stash. So when you press this button now, it's just going to stash the rig to uh, the stash node and then it's going to use that, trans that rest transform um, from the current transform setup. You also can plug in a second input. So if I had, like for example, if I wanted the rest trans transform to actually be something different than the pose that is currently here. I could mess around and do like something like that. And now that's the rest transform. And you'll see once we do that, we get this rest transform attribute. And that's important. It, you can't really save it. I've, 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 you might be able to, I actually, <laughs> I'm not positive. But in my experience, I haven't typically been able to save the uh, skeleton rig and keep that rest transform. I don't know why I might just be, I've also been in an older version of Houdini at my studio. So, uh, but just some info from my experiences. <laughs> Regardless, anyways, uh, you probably wanna create this whenever you're working on a rig at the start. Okay, I'm just gonna delete this and I'm just gonna use the time shift option. Okay, All right, so that's a good one. Um, before this actually, we also want to make sure that our point numbering is set up correctly. And that's actually very important for some things. Here, I'm going to hide the other stuff so we can see. And it, this honestly is probably okay right now. This is probably pretty accurate. But in some scenarios, especially with curve solvers and things, the order of points matters a lot. So let's just mess this up intentionally here. So we'll go a sort and I'm gonna go random. So now the point numbers are all over the place, nothing's in the correct order. I wanna show you how to get it back to the right order procedurally. So we got a node called the Rig Doctor, and this node does a lot of cool things. Come on, plug it in. And uh, we got this button called Output Evaluation Order. And when you click it, you get this new attribute called Eval Order, or Eval Ord. And this essentially is a number, like a, a number hierarchy of the child to parent hierarchy of the, of the rig, I guess. So this is a good thing to sort by. So if we drop another sort, sort, and we drop this down, and now we go by attribute, and we go about order. Now you see these are all in order of, they're not necessarily one after another, but if I was to say grab all of the tail and delete it, now you'll see that the numbering order is always going to be the child higher than the parent, if that makes sense. And that's very important for curve solvers because they rely on like the next point and the next point, and they, they rely on the point numbering system. So I like to do this typically at the start um, just to make sure that everything is set up nice. And then you can run it into the <laughs> stash pose. I also probably delete that eval order tribute just because I try and keep things clean. So there's that. Um, let's keep it going. Some other things you might want to do is, uh, and you don't always want to do this. In fact, a lot of times I don't do this because one, it can be kind of annoying, but it also can help a lot if you need to really constrain the way the rig moves. So there's a configure joints setup. And this I'm actually going to move after the rig stash pose. And this guy essentially tells an FBIK node 
how it can move. It also tells uh, nodes like the uh, like the ragdoll node. You can use this in a ragdoll node also. So so like you even have different modes. You have full body IK, ragdoll, rig pose. So um, I'll use the rig uh, the rest attribute or rest <laughs> rest transform. And now here I can click on a node or a joint. And now here I can click on a joint and it'll automatically set up some center mass stuff for me here because I'm in the center of mass mode. I'm going to clear that. I'm also going to get rid of these joint axes. And now if I click tail, oh, if I, okay, if I switch to limits and now I click tail OM, you'll see we get a very different look and we get a lot of different parameters that are checked on. And what this does, uh, this is probably the most important one. Center mass to me isn't as important in my workflow. It might be for you, I don't know. But for limits, this is defining how far the joint can move or rotate inside of an FBIK setup. So I'm actually going to clear this again, and I'm going to turn off the transformation or translate translation limits so that when I click it, it doesn't check any of them on. But now I can adjust these rotations. And now this joint will be able to rotate anywhere inside of this little fear of rotation. And anywhere outside of it, it's going to try its best not to inside of a full body inverse kinematics. And that sometimes works great. It, it, it's very nice on robotic rigs and um, mechanical stuff, but it also can glitch out a lot if you're trying to stretch it outside of these limits. So just be aware of that. Um, this is definitely nice. One other thing you can do, and this is actually usually how I prefer to set it up, is if you make a motion clip, you can generate those angles based off of the motion clip sequence. So like, let's say I do a rig pose, and I just animate this real quick. All right, now this animation <laughs> isn't great. Probably not even what we'd want. We probably wouldn't want to rotate like this. But for the example, now I'll put this into a motion clip and it's going into the frame range. I'll reload it. And now we have our motion clip. And if I plug this into motion clip, I can now use this compute limits from motion clip and do point number or you can do match by attribute. And now, when I click on one of these, the rotations will already be set up for me. The rotations will already be set up for me. This is real nice if you already have like maybe mocap data or you already have animations maybe on the rig and you just wanna use them to set up the uh, constraint limits. One other thing that's very important is if I display joint axis is the rotation, <laughs> is the rotation order of each of these joints. So you'll see the down order. So on this rotation order, the first uh, first rotation axis is the look at, essentially. So in this scenario, it looks like X is our look at. And then the second one is the up vector, which is Y in our situation, it looks like. And then the last axis is the out vector. So Z, uh, it looks like in most of these scenarios. And that's very important also if you mess, if, if, if that's not consistent, then a lot of these uh, constraint limits are going to really just mess up and tweak out. Uh, if your rotation order isn't consistent throughout the entire rig, you can set it manually on each joint with this rotation order. If you don't check any of these check marks, it's not going to set that and it's just going to use the default uh, rotation order. You also can create a center of mass with this as well. So if you look at a full body IK node, they give you the option to do that here. Uh, but on the configure joints, you actually have some better options where you can plug the configure uh, mass into the rest skin, and then it can configure where that center of mass joint would be based on the skin. So it's just a little more accurate. It doesn't always matter that much. Um, I don't. I actually don't use this configure joints all that often. I use it for specific stuff when I really need to constrain something, but it's it's oftentimes a headache unless you're doing like ragdoll stuff, which we'll get into. But if I'm just animating a rig with general IK and general FK, I usually don't use this too often, but it is one of the things you want to set up first. So I'm actually going to delete this and let's 
So let's take a look at some of the other things you might want to do, which also right off the bat, I'd probably create some groups. It's not the flashiest thing, but if uh, I want to kind of isolate some other stuff later, I, I like to have a lot of groups on these joints just so it's easy to select different sets of joints. And now I'm going to attach this node in the description here because uh, one of my nodes, but there's a few ways you can make groups. Obviously, you're, there's your standard group node. There's the joint. <laughs> there's the joint groups node, and the the issue I have with those is that you have to create a new node for each group. It's kind of annoying. So I have this easy joint groups node, and all this is really doing it's just kind of a fancy group node. And if you click it and you bring up the parameters, you'll see we have the option to add more than one group here. And then when you select the node, uh, the joints, it's actually going to prompt you for the name after you're done. So you don't have to do all sorts of clicking. So I'll select that. Let's create a full body IK group. So for those, the idea here, I guess, is that you create a group of uh, joints that you want to affect the full body IK solver. And typically for me, that is the feet, the hip, the wrist, the head. And if there's a tail, then the end of the tail. And I'm going to hit enter. And now it's going to prompt me for the name. I'll call it FBIK. And now we have our FBIK group. And then you can keep creating. So I could do like select all these guys and call that tail. And then I'll just keep going. I'll, I'll do the groups. Tongue. These are just nice for curve solvers and stuff. I'll do the spine. Spine, sometimes I have the root, or not the root, the hip joint in there. Sometimes I don't. It, it's, it's really a personal preference, uh, especially if you want the curve solver or, or whatever you're using it for to uh, affect the hip or not. So the spine. Then I'll do neck. And another thing I like to do a lot um, for the hands and stuff, I'll have, I'll grab the tips of like the feet or the hands, and then I'll also grab the roots of the, the feet and the hands so that later I can actually just use those as uh, full body IK targets to curl or to manipulate the feet and hands really easily without having, because feet and hands are very tedious usually. You gotta set up a lot of stuff because there's just a lot of them. So in this scenario, I'll call this tip hands, and then I'll do root hands. Do the same thing for the feet. Tip feet, root feet. And then I like to usually get like the twist twist joints on like an IK solver or something. So I'll usually do like a knee group, which is really just like the in-between of the uh, arm, wherever that is. I mean, on, on things like this, actually, it's a little tricky because the legs here have four or, or maybe even five joints. Honestly, I haven't really looked at it that hard. But uh, on scenarios like that, it can get a little tricky to figure out which one is the knee. But uh, you can always adjust these later if you're having issues. So call that knee. And then I usually like to get like the, well, let's grab the eyes also. So eyes, and let's grab like the, let's see what else do we want? We want like maybe the tip of, let's just grab the tip of everything or tip of, uh, let's, let's actually instead, let's, let's grab these guys. These are all joints here that are kind of open-ended. And the point of these is to kind of fake muscle simulation. So these aren't like bones, but they definitely affect the deformation of the rig. And sometimes when you just have like a bone here, the weights on the actual, like if I enable it again, the weights down here near like the tip of the neck are kind of lackluster. So you can add some extra motion with these things. Um, and I'm just gonna put them all in a group just to make it simple. Select enter and I'll call this muscles. Okay, and now you can see I have all my groups here and that's gonna be nice for later on. I think that's going to do it for this one because I'm trying not to make these too long. Uh, in the next one, we're going to pick up on some of the more advanced startup stuff. And then I think the next one after that, I think we'll get into like how to build some of some some more advanced controllers that I, I personally like to use. So thanks for watching. Uh, I'll hope to see you in the next one.